Changing the Sales Game on webtalkradio.com. I am your host, Connie Whitman. Thanks for joining us today. So here's the deal. I know when we talk about sales, right, and changing your personal sales game, oftentimes it comes down to mindset and how we communicate. So to help you on your journey of changing your sales game, whatever that means to you, I have a free gift. In the show notes, you'll find my free communication style assessment. You will get two reports. The first report will spotlight your, just your natural superpowers of how people perceive your messaging. Flip side, your lowest score, typically a blind spot. You'll receive a report on that, kind of shining a light so you understand those that are different than you or communicate differently than you. Your message might not be landing as you had hoped. So again, my free gift to you. I hope it helped you on your journey of changing your sales game. Now, my motivational quote, I just want to set the tone for my conversation with my guest today is by the amazing Jeffrey Gittimer. And Jeffrey says, great salespeople are relationship builders who provide value and help their customers win. Now, throughout my career and, and business, of course, I've had, of course, ups and downs with my numbers um, of sales that I've made uh, for the year, whatever my quote is for, for that particular job. Now, there's one constant that has worked well for me, and that is always about building those deep and intimate, and I don't mean intimate in a weird way, but building those deep relationships with my clients. And that has created not only short-term results, but of course, long-term recurring income for me as well. So how I make people feel, I think matters and helps to build trust and loyalty super quick. Now, today, my guests, we are similar I'm going to pause. And today, of course, I have an amazing guest, Doug C. Brown. Now, Doug is like me. Philosophically, we kind of come from the same strategy. Doug is the CEO of uh, Sales Strategies and a sales revenue and profit profit growth expert. He is the creator of the Top 1% Academy, where he trains on how to sell to buyers, whether CEOs, business owners, or entrepreneurs, and how to be in the top 1% of sales earnings doing so. So please help me welcome the amazing Doug to my show. So Doug, thanks for being on. Hey, Connie. Thanks for having me here. I'm really grateful to be here today. Yeah, we just had an amazing uh, conversation before the show and got to know each other. And I, guys, you are in store for an amazing show. He's funny, he's smart, and he knows what the heck he's doing. So my first question, Doug, what is the process or what have you found to be the process of becoming that 1% earner? And how long does it typically take? So I'll answer the second part. That's easier. So I found about 12 to 24 months is about the average, right? And um, you know, that's that's assuming we have help from people who have been there, done that before, right? If if not, you know, 10, 10 to 12, 15 years, I mean, that type of thing, right? So, um, but so the first, I'm sorry, I forgot the first question. <laughs> the first question was, what is the process of becoming oh. that 1% yeah. earner? Like step one, is it? yeah, step one is getting really truthful about ourselves. Like, do we really want to be that, right? And because there's so many people out there that say, oh, I want to double my sales or oh, I want to be in the top 1% or I want to be this. And the reality is they don't. They, they, they want to be a little better than they are today or a little bit better than that. They want to have more money coming in at the end of each month so that they can go do things and, you know, uh, maybe take care of some of their loved ones and, and without stress and things like that. And whether they want to be a top 1% earner or not, that's it's really not about the number per se. It's about their daily happiness and their daily fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know lots of people who are frankly making tens of millions of dollars a year who are miserable, right? People, but, and, and they're holding on to that. Well, I make 12 million a year, right? It's like, well, but brother, your life's a wreck, you know what I mean? Like, and so then I know people who are making, you know, $1.5 million a year who are happy as, you know, anybody on the planet. So it just depends uh, on what somebody truthfully wants. I'm not honest. That's subjective. Truthful. Most people are honest and that's what gets them into trouble. So the first thing that we do is we zero right in on that. Do Where do you truly want to be? You know, if you're making, say, 300000 a year and you just truly want to get to four fifty, that's okay. In most cases, you won't be in the top 1%. You might be in the top 3%. And that's fine too, but, you know, and then we teach them how to think 
act and be that 1% earner if they want to be. But step number one is getting extremely truthful, brutally truthful with, with that component, because then we can build a plan that actually makes sense. And it, here's the thing. If you're, if you're living to work, that ain't so much fun at the end of the day. And so you have all these millions, you have all this legacy money you're creating for what? So that you could be miserable to the day you die. So yeah, I, that is such, you know, it's so funny, Doug, I've never thought about that, but it's a choice, right? It really does come down to that choice, but we have to be honest with ourselves. Does it, is it because of ego that we want to be 1% or because in our heart of hearts, we feel we can do more being the 1%, like what's the catalyst or motivation behind it, right? Yeah, because and and I I learned this actually from Dave Thomas who built Wendy's. Yeah, and, and um, <clears throat> so I remember him doing an interview, and he in the interview he said building Wendy's was the worst thing he's ever done in his life. No, and I was like, whoa, that cued me in. So I leaned in on that one because at that time I was the guy working for corporate America in a sales position. I was the number one sales rep in the company out of I think three hundred and twenty one or twenty two salespeople we had. Nice. And I was working seven days a week and uh, an instance happened that I'd be happy to share if you want me to. But when he said that, I was like, what? This is Dave Thomas. Like, this is the guy, he built Wendy's. How can he be saying that? And then he said this, he said, because now that I'm out of Wendy's, he's like, I wasted my my life away. I miss my family. I miss this. I miss that all the way through. Now, great. I'm in Florida. I got a boat. Woo woo. You know, that type of thing, right? And he's like, it wasn't worth everything that I thought it was going to be worth. Yeah. And um, I remember Tony Robbins, especially when I worked with Tony, um, you know, he used to always say, sometimes you arrive at a goal and you go, well, is that all it is? And what happened to me while I was listening to this interview with Dave, because I used to be an on the road sales guy and, you know, I was driven because I had a daughter at the time and I, she was not going to grow up the way I grew up, which was kind of lower middle class. You know, um, and I remember I got a call at 10 o'clock at night on a Friday. And it was uh, my wife and she said, you coming home? And I said, yeah, sure. And I got I, and I had one other line holding. I had a client on the other line at 10 o'clock at night. Right. And she, and I said, yeah, I'll be there. She goes, Doug, are you really coming home? And I said, yeah. She said, well, you, you said you were going to be here for a few hours ago. I said, I'm sorry. I got tied up with these client things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she goes, Doug, do you know what day it is today? And I said, "Uh, it's Friday. She goes, yeah, what's the date? I said, I don't know. She goes, Doug, it's your birthday. And and I have been sitting here with your baby daughter waiting for you to come home and we have a cake. And then I heard this thing from Dave. And I was like, okay. (laughs) Divine intervention, my friend. (laughs) So then I got really truthful about it, Connie, because, you know, back then this was in the the eighties and I was making a healthy, multi six figure income, but then I got so good at what I did that the CEO came along to me and offered me a position within the company. And I wanted to be out on my own because that's part of the truthful thing I wanted to be. I wanted to be somebody who could always provide for my family way above. And it wasn't 1% at that point. It was just like, I wanted to be like, I want to pay my house off. I want to have the cars paid off. I wanted everything. You know, I want a couple million dollars in the bank back then because if something happened to me, it would take care of my family, right? Because yeah. um, back then you could still get, you know, four or 5% on the interest. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, well, if I got 2 million, they'll get at least 100 grand a year. And back then you could live on 100 grand, no problem. Yes. And and so so then, I, you know, it was, it was just kind of that epiphany. And I stepped back and I said, okay, what do I truthfully want? Well, I wanted to be on my own. I wanted to always feel like I was ahead of the game because, you know, they were saying it, inflation was three, four, five percent. I was like, nah, it's like 10 percent. Right. So I'm going to make at least 10 percent more a year every year. And I kind of focused. That was kind of my truthful thing. And just as I was about to leave the company, the CEO of the company comes by and offers me a position with a base salary at four hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> and I was like. Oh my gosh. Right. Right. Cause now, cause that's not, that's plus commissions. Right. So, I mean, I can make upwards to a million dollars a year yeah. in this position at this point and going from, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to a million bucks is a, a pretty big raise. Yeah. And, and I remember what Mr. Thomas said, and I s- said to myself, I'm sticking to my guns. 
I'm going to, I'm, I'm playing it, you know, and I didn't take the job. I declined the job and I actually left the corporation. And um, it was one of the best decisions I ever made because that's what led me on the path to understanding how to be a one. No, I would have been a 1% earner at that point, of you course. know, because, but that's what, but now I know how to do it on my own and the pathway to do it. So I didn't know back then I relied on a job. And so if I lost the job, I would have been back to square two, maybe you're not square one. Right. But now that I know the pathway, because Henry Ford also said in an interview, if you took it all away from me, I'd have it back in two years. Cause I know the pathway. So that always stuck in my head too. Yep. And so I learned the path. I learned the process. I learned the philosophy, the psychology, what it needed to be. And then once I had that, I could determine wherever my income wanted to be because I was independent. I'd never relied on a base salary from that point forward. That's right. And so, you know, it's worked out. So that's becoming a 1% earner is much more than just being a sales earner or, you know, or, or something like that. It's really about a whole, like, how do you enjoy your life along the process while you're making into the top 1%? Which is such good advice. And, and it's funny because I believe that if we can processize the, just like our habits in the morning, right? If the lights go out, you could still get ready in the morning without yeah. lights because we know what we do. Our clothes are out. You know where the, you know, the toilet is, you know where the, the sink is. So it's the same thing, I believe, with our careers, with our businesses, whatever, whatever it is that we're doing every day. And if we could processize things, it doesn't matter if you have a bad month, you still know what to do. You're going to get it back or right situations are what they are. So it's funny because when COVID hit, right, I had done everything live, Doug, I yeah. had nothing digitized. Yeah. And all my clients called me, my husband's company closed. We had no income coming in. So here's another lesson, you have money in the bank because rainy days happen, yeah. right? Without us knowing it, they're coming. So that was the one thing. But I said to my husband, he goes, what are you, you going to do? And I said, I don't know yet, but I'll figure it out because I built this business over 19 years. I know how to build a business. I just have to pivot and I just have to learn and figure out what this new strategy is. But I know how to build a business. I have sales skills that's not taken away from me. And now three years later, right, I'm more than what I was Right. You know, before COVID, but the process is so important and it's not, we don't do brain surgery in sales, right? It's <laughs> logic, but if you can approach it in a rinse, repeat logical way, that's how you amp up, I think, faster, right? Yeah, yeah, without question. And, and, and to make sure you adjust, as you said, for times, right? Because post-pandemic selling is very different. Yeah. Not radically different, but very different yeah. than it was. We're still dealing with human beings. Yep. It's just that technology's played a different role. Social media plays a different role, things like that. So we're always going to be evolving. And I think you brought up an excellent point. I, I wrote down about five or six excellent points I thought you brought up. Thank you. Thank uh, you. One of them is, like you said, you're always going to have setbacks. And, um, you know, I was just having a conversation with my daughter about this because my daughter handles some of the bookings for my podcast and things like that, right? And, and I asked her, I said, how's, how's things going? She goes, well, we got kind of a lull going on right now. I said, well, it's, it's in, it, that's a blind spot you got right now. And she's like, what do you mean? I said, it's, it's called sales cycle. So let me guess. And I went through some numbers with her and she's like, yeah, sure as heck. It, you know, it wasn't, you know, I let the numbers drop a little because it was summertime and people would tell me get back in the fall. And I said, those are times you got to push the pedal down even more because it takes you through. And then when you hit the fall and that sales cycle comes back up, now you're going to have too, too many choices on what to do, right? So, and, and, and no matter whether it's something as simple like the blind spot that you brought, you brought that blind spot up at the end of the assessment. And by the way, I'm going to take that. So thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, so it's blind spots that will, you know, I mean, they're blind spots. You can't see them, right? It's like, it's like you look in your mirror, you back up and you hit the whatever and you're like, what happened, right? Well, you didn't see the little pole that was sticking out of the ground because it was a blind spot. Right. And so that's going to happen. And you can just go through the last two years on anything. I mean, right now, I mean, this Canadian fires, right? I mean, we're on the East Coast there. You know, I'm in New Hampshire. It looked like a hazy day uh, for two days here. Um, you know, well, guess what? That affects business. People aren't going out because people are saying, don't go out in this air quality because if you go out in this air quality, you're going to have respiratory issues yeah. that will affect, you know, the, 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 the Ukrainian, you know, war that's going on right now. It's affected things globally. There's all of these things that are always going to consistently going and, and uh, you know, Connie, I know you're 29 and I'm older, 
but the uh, <laughs> the, the reality is that, that um, you know, these have been going on throughout my whole life. You know, so it's the second thing is how do you capitalize on them, which is what you just said. That is a trade of a 1% earner. They go, okay, you know what? Stumble. How do I capitalize on this and how do I leverage this opportunity? And it can be as simple as just a different thought process or pathway. Yes. Um, and I'll give you, can I give an example back in 1978? Yes. yes. So my father had an electric motor machinery repair company and all us boys worked for him growing up. That was the thing. It's, it's actually where I learned communication and sales skills was early on from like five years old. I was talking to people, Beautiful. right? Beautiful skill. And, <clears throat> but every once in a while, somebody would leave equipment that was just too costly for them to repair, but we could repair it because it was still, we, you know, we had wholesale rates on our own, right? And so there was this huge snowblower. I don't know how big it was. It was like a huge thing. It was like, I don't know, probably 60 inches wide or whatever, snowblower. And back then they built these things like an armored vehicle. And so my dad repaired it. And in 1978, we had the blizzard of 1978. And that snow came down. I remember walking out and stepping in the snow and going down and you couldn't see my head. I mean, it was that deep. Now, I was probably 15 or 16 during this yeah. storm, somewhere around there. And so we had to clear our driveway. Well, the plows couldn't do it because the snow was so deep. So we used this big snow blower and it cleared the driveway fine. So my friend, Steve, uh, <laughs> Notre Giacomo, an Italian guy. Um, <laughs> so my friend Steve and I were clearing the driveway and we were watching people shoveling. You know? And so we walked over and said, hey, you want to us to clear your driveway? They go, be happy to pay you. So we cleared the first driveway and the man handed us $25. Now, back in 1978, that was a fair amount of money. Yes. Okay. So we got in our head, huh? we probably can capitalize on this idea and go make some money. And we did. And we go to people's houses and, and they go, well, how much? And we go $75. <laughs> because what I realized was as we were going through that, the bigger the problem, the more they would pay. Absolutely. Right. And yeah. they were gleeful. Some of them had a little, you know, like, like ah, on their, on their, when they heard the price, and then I'd say, okay, well, if you don't want me to do it, just let me know because your neighbor's going to want me to do it, you know? So the point being to the story is when you have too, so many prospects in the funnel, you can be choosy on who you take for clients, right? That's I mean, that's, exactly that's right. what happened. And so Steve and I, in less than seven hours, made $450 snowblowing back in 1978. And to give people context, my first car that I bought in 1979 was $225. <laughs> so, so um, but that's a trade of a 1% earner. I didn't know that now, but innovation and being able to pivot at any, anything, that's a trainable skill. It's right? a trainable so, skill. So that's, um, I think you brought up a lot of great points. I mean, but that, you know, in that long-term relationship you were talking about, that is so key as well, because, if we have long-term deep relationships, then they trust you. And so guess what, folks? If you'd sell into corporations or business to business, these people move from one job to another. So every time they move from one job to another, if you built a great relationship at company A, when they go to company B, you still keep company A plus company B. And all the expansion business that comes from those two networks as well. So again, 1% trade it will be to do that because it's all about leverage and it's all about expansion and it's uh you know one percent earners think and leverage consistently and again it's a learnable skill it is and it's so funny i remember i, I started my business 21 years ago doug and i was introduced to this executive at one of the banks here mm -hmm. in new jersey and they had a salesperson doing what they were doing but I thought this is the right client for me, right? The ch my choice. I'm thinking, oh, I, I really can make an impact here. They're the right size. The whole thing, my philosophy would fit their demographic. They didn't, they wouldn't even talk to me because they had this other vendor and pet spending millions of dollars. Yep. Five years. I followed up with them, Doug, because I thought I know I'm the right vendor. They just don't know it yet. They're going to catch up <laughs> to me eventually. 
finally get the business in a meeting within five minutes, whatever, because I had, I remember I had been tracking and following. I've also been building relationships with the executives every quarter, just how's it going, sending them articles. Hey, I thought this might be interesting to you. Sharing, just sharing information so they could get to know me. And that five-year mark, I don't know what I said in that first five minutes. They were like, we've been looking for you. I said, yeah, I know that. It took you five years to catch up to me. And now I worked with them for 15 years, multi-six-figure contracts. So I made millions. Was And I, when I teach, I say, was it worth following up with them for five years? Yeah, betcha it was. Now, fast yeah. forward, I want to just build on what you just said. Through this organization, right? And I was there so long, people thought I was an employee, okay? Right, right. Everybody knew me, every division, every executive, they all knew me, right? Because I was a regular person in their building. Who's left, who got demoted and left, who left on their own, who, who got moved up, CEOs now. I'm working in all of those banks <laughs> because of the trust. And But here's the most important. Not only did they trust me, I delivered on the back end. So there was always that return on the investment and time that their people came through. That's thinking like that top 1% yep. of the CEO earner. And it's, it's what you said, right? It's leveraging those relationships. But when they moved to these other banks, I didn't go, are you going to hire me now? They reached out to me a week in. Yeah. Con, yeah. I just took a new job. Can you come? Let's talk. Let's talk about the culture. What are we going to do? How, what are we, what are we going to do? I was part of their team. You have to create that. And it takes time. And those long-term relationships are mandatory for all of us as we grow. Yeah. And, and I think you, you also brought up a, another really good point of a 1% earner, which is you do what you say and you say what you do, oh. right? Because a 1% earner, it's all about personal performance. Not not in a in a in an arrogant ego way, but they understand that these people are relying upon them, and you go the extra mile or two if you have to, regardless of whether you even get paid for it or not, because as you did for five years, you stayed with them through the follow up process, right? So they over time it went from okay, Connie's kind of cool, uh, to yeah, this Connie lady. She seems pretty, uh, pretty smart to, you know, Connie. Oh yeah. Yeah. She's, 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 uh, she's, got, she's trustworthy to Connie. Well, um, you know, she's got some great ideas and, and, uh, you know, sharing this unbelievable information with us. And, uh, you know, I think we ought to talk to Connie. And then toward the end, it was like, you know, Hey, <laughs> right. And so it takes, sometimes it takes time when you, in, in, when you're closing biz, bigger business, sometimes, it just, it's a longer sales cycle in many cases. Um, and so the fact is you said what you said, you did what you said you were going to, you showed up when you said you were, and because it's all about personal performance and we know this. And so, you know, those of people who are listening, if you're like, if you say you're going to send something to your client at two o'clock tomorrow and you send it at three 15, eh, you can't do that because some of these people are just looking for that reason. And in their mind, they're going to go, look, can't hit a date. Why would I give you a million dollar contract that you're going to not hit the dates on that as well? Absolutely. Because one of the things that people don't realize a lot of times, Connie, about buyers is they're more interested in their own personal standing mm -hmm. and not looking foolish than they are actually about losing money. Absolutely. And so if we understand the psychology and the, of the buyer, in the, you know, especially a CEO, you know, a lot of people are like, well, sell on pain today, sell on pain today. It still works, you know, but a lot of CEOs today are looking for innovation, right? They're not, they're not looking like they know they got the problem. <laughs> they're not even looking for an opportunity. They're looking for innovation on how to solve the problem and gain the opportunity. Yeah. So we, as a 1% earner have to think differently. And we do, we think, act and, uh, you know, um, and do differently than other people. And that, that's not because we're we're um, special. It's just because, as you said early, you learn the process of this is what's successful, and you follow that process. Um, my grandmother uh, Mary, she had this recipe. Uh, uh, it was it was a some type of Bavarian banana cream cake, mm. <laughs> and. Man, that thing was awesome. Like it, she only made it on Thanksgiving and only made it on Christmas, right? 
I think in some ways it was her way as the matriarch of the family to bait us to come there for Christmas and for Thanksgiving. But every year you went to Grammy's house, you know, that was it. it was like you, you had boyfriends, girlfriends in the family, you know, they all showed up at my grandmother's house. And that grant, that cake was the hit of the party every single year. Well, she guarded, guarded the recipe forever. Right? <laughs> And it wasn't until she was almost in her early 90s that she give the recipe up to my oldest brother. And now, over the years, my mother tried to duplicate it. My family tried to, eh, it didn't work. <laughs> it just wasn't that cake. But the moment we had the process and the exact ingredients in the recipe, my mother made it. And it was like, okay, grandma's back. You know, grandma's passed on, but she's here, right? And so it's, I think you brought up a really... Uh, point that I don't want people to overlook, which is once you understand what the process is that's successful, you can test a different process, but don't mess with it. Like stay with the process because over time, Connie, you've honed your process to a point, like you brought messaging up. How many people are off on their messaging? I mean, you know, so you've got a formula for bringing in a perfect message. I'm sure I, you know, I've never looked at it, but I can just tell talking to you. And so if that's the case, then use the formula because Otherwise, it's like walking into a bar and trying to, you know, pick up a, you know, a, a, my my friend Dave used to do this all the time. I'd go to a bar with him and, and he'd go, uh, I'm going to go pick up that gal over there. You know, let, let me go use my line. Right. And she would inevitably turn him down or, you know, want to throw a drink at him or whatever. Right. And he came over to me and he's like, I can't get it. There are no good women in the world. I'm like, there are no good women in the world, Dave, or your line sucks. Which one? <laughs> Your process is not working to <laughs> change it, right? That's the funny thing. Exactly. We have what we're, we're almost at the end, but I have one more, I think, really important question because remember, I have a lot of corporate clients. Yeah, so they're they listen to the show, the executives, employees, etc. So you never know where we can spark an idea, right? Yeah. For a salesperson to go to the leader to say, Hey, I have this great idea. Listen to this podcast. What is a one percent earner, and why should it be important for a company? to have their sales team comprised of them. What is what is the right dynamic that they should yeah. be looking for? Because that's who you want on your team, I would imagine. Yeah, so a 1% earner, I so in everything I've researched and, and written and done, so a top producer is what a lot of people think a 1% earner is. A top producer is somebody that, per, that produces at the top to produce an article or exchange at, of value at the top. That's kind of the definition of a top producer. Uh, it was actually coined back in 1510, it, but it meant to work with like the royalty, the king, the queen, the duke, the yeah. duchess, whatever, right? And so we all hear about top producers, real estate, especially. Hey, we were a top producer, right? Um, but there's top producers, and then there are overachievers. So overachievers, not necessarily the person who's always going to be that salesperson. Like that, an overachiever is somebody who has a seventh degree black belt, Right. They, they're just like black belt's not good enough. That's a baseline. Right. Uh, they're they're the, the musician that just, you know, continues to keep go and over delivering every single night, even though they're not making the break yet. Right. So an, an elite performer, which I is what a one percenter is. That's what I call them. It's a combination between a top producer and an overachiever. We want to look for those traits. And so sometimes in corporations, they, they try to hire through resumes and it's hard to hire through a resume to find an elite producer because sometimes their traits are what would be called soft skills, right? That, that, that you know, it's all about personal performance, right? So that's what we want to look at. One of the ways of it, um, so when you, you can test for these things, you can test and find out ego strength, empathy strength, different types of things. You can also test to find out, are they actually, uh, do they have the will to close? Are they consultative selling, right? So we use sales specific and I would recommend not using like disc profiles or anything other than personality, but sales specific uh, tests for these type of things. So that's what they want to look for um, in, in that the, uh, now 1% earner in my world, I look at it geographically, like in New Jersey, it's, it's, it's higher than it would be in West Virginia per se, correct. right? That's correct. So, um, so I look at it that way. And then, um, the, the couple of things they should do in the interview process, they have to ask people all the same questions. They have to have a standardized process for recruiting because yeah. most companies just go on gut. Oh, I like this guy. He's probably going to be, you know, <laughs> or I like this gal, right? So there's got to be consistency in the questions and we've got to 
we got a lead score just like we would lead score a perfect lead. And so we figure out the traits we want for the company, how they fit into the organization, what they want them to do. And then we, we, we put them through that process and we test them before we hire them. We actually give them a little bit. So I'm giving kind of part of the recruiting process. Why do they want them? Okay, well, they'll outsell your next five salespeople combined. <laughs> and so yep. they're great for revenue and profit generation. But once you understand that from a corporate point of view, and this is what I did when I, I worked uh, with Tony Robbins and Chet Holmes in their organization. I'm going to brag a little bit. I raised their, their close rate from 17.8% to 43.2% in the first six months. Nice. And what I did is I looked at top performance. I looked at elite performers. I just went there and I benchmarked them as the elite performers. Once we got the elite performers, we benchmarked against that. And so anybody who didn't kind of fit close to that, we just see ya. Then what we did is we took our whole sales team and we said, okay, if you're not here, we're going to take these elite performers and make them our lowest performing people. And then every year we would take out 10 or 15% of the bottom end and hire higher elite performers. Yep. If we do that year upon year upon year, revenues will skyrocket in a company. The only thing I got to tell people is these people are a little bit of a maverick. So you got to make some room for them because they're free thinkers and it's all about performance and if you don't have systems and processes to handle these people, we want to look at that first because yeah. these people will come in and they will make it up if you don't have it. Yeah. But so you just said something about the process. It, it's got to be rinse and repeatable. Yeah. Otherwise, we're throwing spaghetti against the wall and, you yeah. know, what's sticking? It's, it's a crapshoot. Right. So that so um, so important. Here's here's the, the I'll just make you laugh. So when I started my career in sales, um, backstory, but I won't get into that because we're almost out of time, but I was selling insurance and do you know, they almost didn't hire me. And I'll tell you why, because I didn't have enough debt. I came out of college with no debt. I worked full-time and went to school full-time and my parents helped. Right. So I was very blessed. Second thing is I, I bought my car, uh, cash from yeah. my dad who helped me out <clears throat> again, but I paid cash. So I had no debt. And they were like, yeah, you're not going to be motivated. And I'm thinking, what, what is that? That's not going to motivate me. I'm motivated. I, yeah. I know I want to make money. I wanted, I wanted to buy my own house within five years. Like there were all these things and goals I had. They almost didn't hire me because of that one criteria. So I think we have to be really careful about processes and, and the tests like you're describing. They have to be very clear as to what you're looking for so that you really truly get what you call the elite performers. And I love that categorization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like match.com when you think about it, right? I mean, match.com tries to do this for dating, right? In in some ways. So we first again have to get very truthful about who we want, how we want them to be, and how we want them to play within the organization. And then we've got a great profile for that. And then from there, we just it's it's like the ideal target buyer when you're going out to look for you know, the, uh, for, for the accounts you're going out for, That's right. you want to scope down what the ideal target buyer is and only talk to the ideal target buyer, because that shortens the sales cycle that improves the close rate. And, you know, and, and they know other ideal target buyers. So Absolutely. it's just, it's the same process, but what I've seen in companies all the time, rampant is they they don't have a systematized question asking process or, or hiring process so it's it's subjective and that's where things you know the blind spots come in and they drop through the cracks they make a bad hire and then they're like oh my gosh this just cost us a ton of money right. well it didn't have to the other thing i would tell people is be a little more patient when you're hiring people now it doesn't mean you don't make offers quickly but be a little more patient about you know having more people come through and and um versus trying to make a decision in a month costing you a bad bad play you know, make that decision in two months and get the right people because you, you don't need like with elite performance, the more you can get, the the, the more your company's going to grow. I mean, it's it's that Exponentially. simple. Exponentially. Yes. It, it, you know, numbers don't lie, um, no. but you have to have the good processes going in. Again, it's all about the process and build it. Right. But Doug, it's all about building the relationships internally as well. 
Who do you want to attract? Who's going to fit into your culture? Who's going to fit into your process and execute whatever the vision is of the culture? I go, I go into a lot of companies and they don't even have a culture. They go, oh, right. we don't know. Well, if you don't know, how, how do you expect your people to communicate? What do you want the client to feel like there's, there's all these moving parts. You have to define what those answers are. Otherwise we're throwing spaghetti against the wall and it's, it just becomes time is money. And I think we forget that eh, it took me an hour, but what could you have been doing more efficiently with that hour that could have created revenue with less angst, with that less stress, right? Again, it's about the process and all the things we've talked well, about. We can make a very strong argument, Connie, you and I, that that hour, we could have closed the $14 million sale. Exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. So it, it, again, guys, go back and listen to the show because I think Doug shared so many good tips that were, you know, within the context of our conversation. So please go back and listen. I think this is a must listen second time, maybe even third time. And I would absolutely take some notes. If you have questions for Doug, you can email him directly. It's Doug at CEO sales strategies. Dot com so plural website is ceo sales strategies.com and also doug has a free gift for us um i'll put that in the show notes the link but can you tell everybody what it is doug so they know what they're signing up for yeah i wrote a book or an ebook anyways uh on the what i call the non-stop one percent earner so it goes through the psychology philosophy and the practical application about what is a one percent earner and how how do they play and what do they do uh, it's a it's a very short read, a quick read, uh, and you know, if, and especially uh, if somebody's interested in in knowing more about that, I would read that. If they're hiring people and want to know about that, I would definitely read that because um, it'll give them ideas to uh, understand how to benchmark against. Yeah, it's like fifty three pages, right? Yeah, it's. I yeah, mean, I downloaded you know. it. It's like fifty three pages. It's a no brainer, great start point. And then if you have any questions, especially if HR people are listening, sales leaders are listening, or sales people are listening. Um, reach out to Doug, pick his brain, ask him questions. Of course, go to the website for even more information. Doug, thank you so much. Truly, this has been just a joyous hour or or so uh, for me getting to know you first and then us recording the show. Um, you're, you're amazing. What you're doing is amazing. And I, I hope people take it to heart and start implementing. It starts in our brain, right? It starts in our mind of how we approach, in this case, sales. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Connie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very grateful. Oh, truly, truly a pleasure. And I hope you will join me weekly as we question, build, and discover together that no matter where you are on changing your sales game to up your game personally, I hope between my guests and I that our stories, our strategies, our ideas, our tips are implementable for you so that you could create the change you're looking for. Here's the deal. Information's a beautiful thing. We always have to keep learning. If you do nothing with the information, it's just information. Once you start applying it and creating the changes you're looking for, those baby steps add up to, into giant steps in your career, your business, your life. So please take some of the ideas. Um, you Read the book, the 53 pages uh, of the book and start to implement some of the strategies Doug and I talked about. And then of course, read. Um, I guarantee you'll make results on the back end. You got to implement, guys. It's not just about listening and learning. It's about executing. Um, Doug, thank you again for being on. Uh, truly a pleasure. And thank you all for tuning in. You've been listening to Changing the Sales Game with me, your host, Connie Whitman on webtalkradio.com. I truly wish you an inspired week filled with change and then you fill in the blank. You know what you need to change personally. And I hope that our ideas today and strategies are implementable so that you create the change you're looking for. And trust me, magic starts happening. I love you all. Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Have a great one.